In an intimate corner of Chicago's Third Coast Cafe, Grammy award-winning jazz vocalist Kurt Elling shared his thoughts on jazz, spirituality, the creative work process, and being in the moment. My name is Elizabeth Alfano, host of the TV show, web series, and podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party. Grab a snack and belly up, as Kurt has some powerful things to say about life as an artist and life on the road. After a quick word about podcasts and a word from our sponsor, Adora Therapy, I'll be right back with cool jazz cat, Kurt Elling. Life is challenging, and everyone needs a tool they can use to shift their mood in the moment. Adora Therapy is an aromatherapy company that makes mood boost, personal sprays, and room scents for every occasion. Blends like lavender chamomile, cinnamon clove, and blood orange bergamot are only some of the fragrances from Adora Therapy's unique line of specialty scents, carefully mixed to trigger chakra points, and to help you boost your mood. Plus, Adora Therapy sprays and roll-ons are pre-blended, vegan, cruelty-free, and ready to go. The perfect size to fit in your purse and take with you to boost your mood anytime, anywhere. So treat yourself to a mood boost and share the gift of stunningly packaged mood boosts with others. Visit adoratherapy.com and... Don't forget to like us on Facebook. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party, with me, Elizabeth Alfano, on iTunes. Just search for The Celebrity Dinner Party, or if SoundCloud is your thing, you can find me there, too, by searching for The Celebrity Dinner Party. Subscribe, and you'll never have to hunt for engaging and inspiring interviews again. They'll just land on your computer or your iPhone every time a new podcast comes out. So subscribe now to The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano, because the best conversations really do happen over dinner. talking with me today. Yeah. It's great that we could get this little cozy spot at the Third Coast Cafe. It's a nice little spot. Because the Green Mill is packed already <laughs> with people waiting for you tonight. So it's a thrill to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, you have a really interesting background. Your father was a chaplain musician, mm-hmm. yeah. and you were in church choirs your whole life. Mm-hmm. And then you went to the University of Chicago School of Divinity, mm-hmm. and you chucked it all for jazz. Yeah. Just one credit before you graduated. How did you make that decision? Well, I'm not sure if I chucked it all or if it chucked me. Um, uh, you know, I grew up uh, having uh, music and kind of a transcendental orientation uh, as co-equal uh, experiences. And the music served the life of the spirit and the spirit informed the life of the music. And uh, now, again, I think they're interchangeable for me. But for a while there, I felt the need to really explore everything that, it, that I could about the spirit side and to sort of get a map, a terrain right. of the conversation uh, in the West up until, you know, Paul Ricoeur and people who are writing now. Uh, and uh, as I was trying to do that, I was sitting in in clubs every night with mm-hmm. Vaughn Freeman, God bless him, and, wow. and Eddie Johnson and, uh, and Ed Peterson. And uh, eventually the scales kind of tipped and the amount of time I was spending in the clubs increased. Right. And the amount of time I spent trying to stay awake reading Heidegger oh, gosh. decreased. <laughs> so uh, it was pretty clear when the time came. So is that what jazz is for you? A, a transcendental conversation? A spiritual conversation? Well, I think that uh, artwork uh, in any field that attempts to answer 
questions about what it is to be human right. and what our experience is here and what it's like and what our possibilities are are automatically engaging uh, forces and energies and uh, ideas that transcend yes. our everyday sort of more pedestrian experience and attempt to form that and, and, and attempt to enrich that. Yes. Um, so I think that kind of by definition works of art are trying to heighten our awareness right. of, of our time here. I would agree with that, but you mentioned some things that are very personal, I might even say very solitary, and yet the way you approach your music, it's such a dialogue with the audience, and it's a community, yeah. so it, it's also something that you engage other people in. Yeah, well, I think the, I mean, I, you know, uh, art certainly can be engaging. I know from, from my standpoint, if you're really going to try to be a success at it, then you need to try to bring people along. And jazz is a challenging and uh, often difficult music, but jazz singers have traditionally been ambassadors of a sort for the music. And it's one thing for Charlie Parker or Lester Young or John Coltrane to play a difficult passage of music, but it's another thing entirely for someone with a, a voice to sing exactly that same passage. Right. There's a way in which more of the people can hear and somehow comprehend the music if it's coming through a voice. And then if you also have lyrics attached to something, then there's a definite story they can follow. Right. And if you're engaging and make eye contact, and, right. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a much less sort of ivory tower uh, experience as a jazz singer. There's no instrument to be behind right. that blocks people. Uh, there's no piano to hide under if they start throwing things. Uh, which they don't. Which, <laughs> which Not they, yet. Which they have on occasion. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, it's part of the pleasure of being a singer, mm -hmm. uh, is that I get to deal as a jazz musician in a world of, in a realm of improvisation and interaction, as you've mentioned, interaction with the other musicians, right. interaction with the tradition of music uh, that's very demanding mm -hmm. and unforgiving. Really? If you don't uh, stay with it. I mean, as, uh, as Gwendolyn Brooks said, you know, art is a requiring courtesan. Mm. So you must stay with stay it and up. practice all yes. the time. And, you know, those are all things that appeal to me, uh, a, a big enough challenge. The discipline of art. The high enough mountain um, to really something that's so much greater than me that I'll never reach the other side of it. Yes. But that is a worthy thing to attempt nevertheless. Something that you're always striving for. I, I wondered then, you seek out a challenge? Because last night, some of the things that you were doing were so difficult. <laughs> really, it seems that you seek out difficulty and challenge by your exploratory nature and this willingness to sort of break open the music and mm -hmm transform it really uh, well as a jazz person the goal is to attempt on a given night to play a melody even if you're playing a composition that you've played a hundred times before to find a way through that composition some area some sequence of notes that you as the individual artist and potentially no one has ever played before so you're always trying to overcome what you've done before and to play better than you did the night before and to find something new and to, to hear something in tonight's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So the audience is a necessary part of that and the other musicians are a necessary right. and we all lift each other up at the same time. Yes. And there's that sense of discovery, which I guess there yep. lies the joy. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that you are sort of interpreting the music through vocals. Do you see yourself as a conduit or a translator, maybe, if you will, of the sometimes, music? Sometimes, sometimes when I'm doing vocalese work, um, vocalese is a subset of lyric writing in which um, the lyricist takes a existing recording that is an instrumental recording, either of a saxophone solo or piano solo or a bass solo or maybe a drum solo, 
and the lyricist learns the solo, learns the notes, does a transcription, meaning I write in notation what the notes are and the rhythms are, and then I create a lyric to fit the contours of that instrumental solo, and then I learn how to sing that solo. Wow, it's such a complex process. Uh, I suppose so, yeah. It's, it's complicated because you need to be precise and you need to be mindful and you need to come up with a lyric that is bespoke for the what began as an improvisation. Right. And so you need to have the rhymes of the language and the rhythms of the language fit exactly the contours of a non-linguistic sonic event and have the rhymes fall where the rhymes, if you will, of the music fall. Yes. So it has to, it has to, it's a very specific kind of a task. And then you have to have hip content to put into yes. it. And what are you really singing about? And does it apply right. emotionally to the original uh, artifact of music? and the original intent of the composer. So it was a lot of commentary and a lot of layering. Yes, and, a lot of layering. Um, you almost, does, do you feel like you're sculpting almost, working things in together and molding something mm. with content that's important? I, I don't, I guess or I don't. Evoking. Yeah, I guess I don't think of it as a, as a sculptural moment uh, as much as I think of it. I mean, it's, a, it's an act of creative writing and it's an act of craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an, it's an act of musicianship because you have to know enough about the music and feel the music uh, appropriately to its, to its own end. Mm -hmm. You have to feel the emotional impact and intent so that the content of uh, the lyric that you're writing, if anything, serves and potentially amplifies emotionally and intuitively for where the rhymes of language would fall yes. to coincide with what you could also call the rhymes of the melody. Right. So where a rhythm hits, you have to have a way for the rhythms of language to lay the same way. Yes. And you have to think of whatever story you're telling. Right. So it's a, it's a demanding little subset of lyric writing that uh, John Hendricks and Eddie Jefferson invented. And I think it's really worthwhile. I think there's a lot of areas of content that haven't been explored yet, because uh, it's a very young form of art. And it's uh, exciting to me, because there are a lot of players whose work hasn't been attempted. Um, right. I've been able to do people like Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock and um, Freddie Hubbard and some of the really, uh, what uh, would you call it, uh, really groundbreaking John Coltrane, the people who have pushed the music as, you know, Further than anybody, and then, and then people who are who are, you know, living and working now, uh, who are really the spear point tip of the music, um, and to present that to an audience in a way that is comprehensible, right? In a way that goes speaks to their heart and not necessarily just to their head. In a way that is transparent and in a way that tells a story without people noticing how much work has gone into it right. leading up to tonight. Yes. Um, so very complex and yet very life-affirming as you're working with this intellectual capacity, the emotional capacity, and of course the visceral, what the music means to you. You interpret it first yeah. and then give it to well, everyone. Well, and visceral in that I'm actually the instrument. Right. I'm actually producing the sound, yes. so the effort that it takes to do that, I'm a given night can be a lot as well. Well, and I have to ask you this. I think I read that you perform 200 nights mm. a year. Well, and not I, every year, but this year I will for sure. Because, of course, you're promoting your new DVD, mm. The Gate. And so I wonder, how do you protect your voice? Uh, well, uh, I'm a professional, so I mean, I take very good care of it. Uh, it's, you have to be something of a, have an athletic mindset. Uh, it's as much the things that you don't do as the things that you do. I try to get enough sleep and take my vitamins and... Um, the basics. Yeah, you know, don't do stupid things. And and, uh, and then I have to have a really good singing technique that allows yes. me to do all of these 
crazy things that I do without hurting myself. So it's moment. not too demanding, 200 nights? I would think that that would it's hard. be demanding, of course. It's it hard. I tend and you're to, on the road. I, I, tend to, I tend to... I tend to think that uh, uh, people who work in other genres who have a much easier time of it in terms of their schedules, opera singers and the like, they could take a couple of hints from the uh, road warrior over here. Is that I'll right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they'll sing one night and I'll take two or three nights off. Yes. Before, you know, it's like, oh, well, really? I see, so you are oh, not a diva. Really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you know, now I wonder, as you do a lot of scat, too, which is um, adding sounds to music, not lyrics, but sounds to music, and you have a daughter who is six years old. When she was young, did you ever sort of reinterpret Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? Did you find yourself scatting to your daughter to put her to oh, sleep? Oh, no, not really. No? Not like that, no. You keep things simple for kids, you know. Um, I imagine music is in your household all the time for her, just like uh, it was for you. To, yeah, try to keep it, try to keep it going. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Well, of course, um, you have nine Grammy nominations, and you've won a Grammy Award, and you've sung all around the world, the Sydney Opera House. You'll be back in Chicago at the CSO for Valentine's Day, New York, Lincoln Center. But that wasn't always how it was. So when you were just starting out in Chicago, I'm wondering where did you live, and what sort of jobs did you do to keep it going? Well, when I cut out of graduate school, I lived in a basement apartment down in Hyde Park for about $150 a month. Rock on. And uh, I had about a $300 Subaru that I bought to try to get back and forth to gigs. Um, and I was moving furniture and tending oh, wow. bar. And, uh, Where did you tend bar? Uh, there was a little place called the Torchlight Cafe up at Roscoe and Paulina. Yeah. I used to live there. Oh, okay. Yes, I love that place. Yeah, yeah. So I used to work there, um, and uh, I was just trying to hustle up gigs. Right. You know, so I would take my little Kinko's packet around. Yes, right. With all my little made-up quotes. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, you know, try to hustle up work, and you know, nine times out of ten, the little press kit would go in the garbage before I left the room. You know, because what do they need a what a Got a jazz singer and a, and, a, and a male jazz singer at that. Um, Is it harder for men? Uh, yeah, there. I, I think so. I think the expectations of what uh, club owners and, and of many patrons are that there's, you know, I mean, I, there were plenty of times when, you know, the manager or what have you would say, uh, oh, you know, uh, we get a lot of businessmen in here and uh, uh -huh. we're going to have somebody sing. We need, we need something in a skirt, you know, or really. Okay, well, okay. But then you just go to the next place and the next place and the next place. And, uh, if you got enough Johnny Hustle in you and, you know, you figure out uh, ways, you know, back in the day I would have come in here and I would have said, hey, you know, you I could just bring a guitar player in here and you wouldn't lose a table and we could play real quiet and nice for people. And why don't we just try it for a week? And if you don't like it, we don't have to do it anymore. And if you like it, just give us, you know, Whatever. give us some lunch or something for the afternoon. We'll just start it from there, you know, and they'll be like, well, okay, yeah, but that doesn't cost me any money, and I don't lose a table, and here's this kid, and let's give it a shot, maybe it's a thing. But you've got to have the willpower to walk into situations like that, right. and to believe enough, and then to have a nice assortment of tunes, and be willing to play to a room that's two-thirds empty, and nobody's listening, and, and be happy about having a chance to sing. Mm -hmm. I think for all starting artists, that's what they need is to all, almost be a jack of all trades. So you have to yeah, be, of course, good at your craft, but you've got to be an entrepreneur and you've got to be business minded mm -hmm. and you have to be able to take no for an answer again and again and again and keep going. You have to have a certain drive. Yeah. And for such a cool jazz cat, Ugh. you strike me as a man who's very disciplined. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Uh, sometimes I think out, out of out of my hearing range, people, the other cats will say, "Wow, man, well, Kurt's so lucky. He's got this, and you know, it's like luck." And I said, like, "Well, man, you don't rest." If this is what luck is, <laughs> I mean, luck. I think a luck is something that's like somebody walks in the room and just hands you a check, or you know, you find money in the streets. That has never happened to me. That's no. not happened to me either. <laughs> and you know, my luck has come from. A lot of hard work and a lot of desire and, yes. as you say, discipline and, and wanting it more. Right. 
I tell I tell my my singing students when they're asked when they ask about their business, and really you know any advice that is worthwhile to anybody. It isn't you know the advice I can give really doesn't have to do with. I mean I can give advice about how somebody sounds. I can give advice about. Uh, the experience of being on stage and whatnot. And we can get into that, but the only real overall overarching advice, blanket advice, if you will, that, that could be applicable would be, you know, if you want this or whatever you want, you have to want it more. Right. And you have to work for it harder. More than other people or than more anybody, than anything you... Than anybody you meet, you have to want it more than any other person that might also want that thing. Yes. You have to work harder, you have to be more disciplined, you have to be smarter, you have to have more heart, you have to be able to take it on the chin. Again and, and again. And keep going and you have to, you know, figure it out and you have to be ready to do that from day one till, you know, whatever the end point is. Right. And that's really all, that's, that's luck. That's luck, is having enough spine. Right, and that's something I think is sort of given to you. You really can't craft that. That sort of hard work, just yeah, never you giving up. It. Yeah, you, it has to be, you know, wherever it comes from, you, one has to find it. Right, one has to tap into that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to go back a, a little bit, we were talking about the songs that you reinterpret and mm -hmm. you go in and explore and discover and sort of break open. I'm wondering how do you pick which standards you're going to do this with? Is it something that speaks to you personally or do you research this song my voice would apply to better and no, I can no, know? No, no, it's, it's a very intuitive, it's not even really a process. I mean you spend a lot of time in music, you spend a lot of time doing the work, um, a lot of time on the road, as yes. we said, and you listen to a lot of music because you love it, because uh, you want to check out what everybody else is doing, and I want to know what, what Meldau's up to these days, and I want to know what Wayne is up to these days, and I want to yes. know, you know what, other, what other members of the jazz family are, are producing now, and sometimes uh, that will enter your consciousness, and, and just from the joy of it, just from like, wow, that sounds killing. Well, that puts me in mind of, or, wow, that sounds killing. I, 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 should, I should really take that idea seriously. And if that's the case, then this is, the, you know, we all inform each other. Yes, of course. You let build, alone, build yeah, up each let other. Let alone listening back to some of my favorite Lester Young recordings or uh, Coleman Hawkins or, you know, and, and then they'll play, wow, man, this tune, Diamonds for Your Furs, I should, Violets for Your Furs, I should really, uh, what's the lyric on that? That sounds lovely. And then you do a little, but it's all just, things that you remember or come across or are given that you like, that are obvious that speak to you. things to follow up on. And so it isn't like you just, you, you're looking through lists or catalogs or anything like that. You don't in say, my I, case. I haven't done Stevie Wonder in a while. No, it doesn't, it's not, like, not that. like that. You know, things, things fall together because, I mean, also because I'm writing, mm -hmm. then I'm producing uh, things that kind of put you into a certain sonic neighborhood or call for, you know, it's like, well, we should have John McClain on that cut because it, you know, it's just all, all this intuitive stuff that goes through your mind, but is right. coming from whatever synapse, synaptical connections are being made. Right. That have to do with just your being immersed in a, a, a lifetime of music. So when you perform on stage and you have these improvisational moments or when you're practicing with your colleagues and you have these improvisational moments and you tap into something good, is it something you try to bottle and write down or you just leave those improvisational moments and you write down lyrics later at a different point? Um, well, there's just a lot of stuff that, I mean, you know, uh, you're just blowing. A lot. You know, when you're on stage, you just you, all the homework that you do beforehand, you leave behind so that you're just here Free. now in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't really about capturing. Sometimes somebody will record it, or you know, you'll be doing it, whatever, for archival purposes only. Is what they say. Um, and sometimes you'll hear a little something, but it doesn't really come, in my case, from from the kind of process that you were describing. Okay. So it, the the writing is its own separate mm -hmm. 
discipline where you maybe yeah. lock yourself in a room or you well you, you know you work on it little by little you chip away at it chip just away. like every other writer and every other creative discipline you know, mm -hmm. you've got to sequester yourself in your mind and in my case I have to have the music basically memorized so that I can let it play in my unconscious um, and follow the story and, and engage the, the craftsmanship of writing. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of editing that has to happen when I'm writing a lyric. Because mm -hmm. um, it has to, again, fit the gestures and the shapes right. of, the, of the music. It has to be bespoke. It is such an intellectual exercise as well as emotional. And, um, you know, with improv, you might have these great moments on stage, but then you never see them again because it's improv, yeah. it's just there. It's just for that is, is that hard or no. is that no sort of the beauty of it? Well, it's part of, the, it's part of the beauty of it and it's part of the gift that you give to people on a given night, which is right. why it can be frustrating when you're on stage and your things are starting to fire and then you notice somebody with their phone recording things or ah. their, because it's like, well, wow, man, like, we're all here right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And and you're not here right now. You're thinking about this, and you're worried about your technology. And, and you're, showing your and friend you, later. Yeah. yeah. It's like, that's, that's kind of a drag. I mean, I don't mind the, I don't mind the idea of people being, and certainly I'm happy that people are excited, and I don't mind people having um, some kind of a artifact of a given performance night, but it does take them out of the moment. Of the experience for themselves. They've for missed themselves, out. and right. it means that they're they're robbing me of the energy that I need from from the audience right. to some extent to really continue to produce this stuff because there is this circle of energy that needs to be uh, connected. You know, it needs to be a complete circle. Right. And to have people if they're just like this, it's like ugh. You know, they, I'm giving you this gift right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Be I'm here not, for it. I'm not giving yeah. you this gift for later. I'm yeah. giving you this gift for right, right now. Right now. So. Thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining in on The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano. To stay in the know, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at DinnerPartyCHGO and on Facebook at Elizabeth Alfano and at The Dinner Party. To subscribe to this podcast, find The Celebrity Dinner Party on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And if you want to send me an email about today's podcast or anything else, you can find all my information at www.thedinnerparty.tv. The editor of The Celebrity Dinner Party is Andrew Jensen. The original recording engineer is Tim Barron. The original music is by The Websters and Ship Captain Crew. Of course, the song Golden Lady is performed by Kurt Elling doing the very classic Stevie Wonder song. Thanks for listening today and join me on the next Celebrity Dinner Party podcast where the best conversations happen over dinner. <laughs>